interest. I see. All right, so I guess it's time to start. Uh, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce Kang Kuen Ni, who is going to talk about building fully controlled single molecules today. And um, just a brief bio info, Kang Kuen got her undergrad degree in 2003 from UCSB. And then she joined the groups of Debbie Jin and Jun Yi at Jila and UCB Boulder, where she created the first dipolar quantum gas of ground state KRB molecules, which uh, made headlines in 2008. And I believe the paper was cited more than around 2000 times by now. So it's, it generated, um, um, you know, essentially a new field of uh, few many body physics was also called polar molecules and also exploring their chemical reactions and controlling them in external electric field was a, was a very interesting paper, uh, which followed almost immediately the first creation of that, of that gas. Then after creating, after earning her PhD in 2009 from Gila, NIST and University of Colorado Boulder, Ken Quen worked with Jeff Kimball at Caltech as a center of physics of information postdoctoral fellow and with Eric Cornell at Gila as a national research council postdoctoral fellow before joining the faculty at Harvard Chemistry Department, where she has been since 2013. So her research uh, focuses on uh, ultra cold polar molecules and developing um, really ingenious experimental techniques for making these molecules and for using the molecules to explore the fascinating world of ultra cold chemistry and also precision measurement. So some of her recent results include building ultra cold molecules from ultra cold atoms, kind of one atom at a time from optical tweezers and then creating optical tweezers array of optical molecules and um, very detailed in-depth studies of quantum chemistry dynamics in the chemical reactions of, of, of KRB molecules. So, uh, and Ken Quen won numerous awards uh, such as the Mock Thesis Prize in 2010, um, Sloan Research Fellowship in Physics in 2015, and most recently, uh, the Rabi Prize in AMO Physics from the uh, American Physical Society. So, um, so let me welcome Kang Quen. Thank you, thank you, Timur, for the kind introduction, and thank you to the Vemos team for putting together such a nice seminar series, and for the invitation to speak. Also, I'd like to thank uh, to all of you for joining me at this talk. Today, I'd like to share with you some recent work that I'm very excited about, where we bring a single sodium atom and a sodium and, and a single cesium atom together to make a molecule in their row vibrational ground state and predominantly in the motional ground state of an optical tweezer. This is a fully controlled molecular qubit ready for a range of quantum applications. Because my main affiliation is in a chemistry department, I want to start from a slightly different perspective compared to a usual AMO seminar. I think a molecule as perfect quantum machines. They have rich quantum degrees of freedom that give unique transition as fingerprints or ways to probe them. In the chemistry domain, this degrees of freedom, uh, uh, the, the degrees of freedom allow different imaging tools, for example, uh, stimulating Rama imaging of vibrational transitions um, get molecular specificity under a microscope. These two images uh, look at the same thing, but much more useful information um, is gained when you can tell the molecular content. Um, another example, nuclear, magne uh, nuclear magnetic imaging, uh, here show where water is. While molecular quantum degrees of freedom allow us to identify and study molecules in their innate environment and generate uh, these widely used tools in chemistry, biology, and medical setting, in the physics domain, these characteristic transition frequencies allow us to use them as standards for time and meters. In this community, um, everyone knows about atomic clocks, so I just want to mention that the first atomic clock was in fact based on the vibration of ammonia molecule at 24 gigahertz. The more modern uh, atomic clocks nowadays are based on the vibration of electronic density. Um, and, and let me just give you an animation of how these intrinsic frequency in molecules or atoms connect to the ticking of a clock. What we see here is the familiar SMP atomic orbitals from your first year chemistry or physics course. When we drive a transition halfway um, to bring the atoms into superposition, 
um, of SMPs, we can see the ticking of the clock as the moving electronic probability density. I am showing here 10 to the 15 times slower uh, of what the clock uh, nowadays would actually tick. Um, and the same picture um, of, you know, ticking on the clock, things that are moving, uh, applies to qubits or other quantum systems. Atomic clock have advanced significantly since 1949. Nowadays, they would not lose a second in a time longer than the edge of the universe. This is enabled by the development of quantum control such uh, techniques such as laser cooling and trapping of atoms, motivated uh, precisely by building better atomic clocks. These techniques has led to a whole new and exciting direction of atomic and molecular physics and chemistry. Specifically today, I will be talking about quantum control techniques applied to molecules that allow cooling and trapping of, uh, of molecules and enable long interaction time and long probe time uh, uh, looking at these uh, type of system. This also enable us to prepare molecular system as building block for more quantum, uh, for more complex system. There are a large number of big scientific uh, directions people um, in, under this kind of umbrella field of uh, ultra cold molecules um, pursue. Uh, my talk will be focusing on building fully controlled uh, single molecule for uh, future application on quantum simulation and, and computation. We're not quite um, beginning to explore in these, uh, these, uh, these quantum machines yet uh, for, from the point of view of uh, molecules. And at the end, I will also touch on um, really in, in just in a few uh, sort of picture story uh, that, uh, that my group have been pursuing enabled by the technology again of quantum control of molecule to explore fundamental aspect of chemical reactions. Okay, um, so a general goal in the quantum science, and you've heard a lot in uh, many of the talks in this series, is to create quantum systems with qubits that are a qubit that's just a general term of two bodies, uh, sorry, two, two level systems that are fully controllable, scalable, and can be entangled uh, to perform logic gates. A variety of physical systems, as shown in pictures, um, you know, a few of them shown here can already reach such a goal. Um, however, challenge remains including um, achieving very high fidelity entanglement of um, operations um, in a scalable system. In my group, we are interested in uh, tackling this challenge by developing a new physical system, namely fully controlled molecules in a scalable approach. Um, so um, the reason we think molecules are promising uh, for these type of um, scalable quantum system is because of their vast internal degrees of freedom. Um, as I alluded in the very first slide, these quantum degrees of freedom um, can and can uh, can be utilized to serve different functions or requirements for desired applications. And each one of these degrees of freedoms are intrinsically coherent. For example, nuclear spins, uh, we can utilize them for uh, information storage and molecular rotations uh, that will allow dipole-dipole interactions uh, between molecule and that can be uh, utilized to entangle them. And if there's time, and I will come back to give more detail about how we might actually go about doing this. The focus of this talk is about the experimental uh, approach that we had sort of set up a number of years ago to gain first single particle control of molecule and fully control its quantum degrees of freedom. And I'm happy to say that we've now achieved this uh, recently. Um, in particular, uh, we are interested in preparing molecule in the row vibrational ground state, and in particular vibrational ground state in the single um, other you know, degrees of freedom quant uh, quantum states. And the reason is that these in the vibrational ground state, these molecules will have a large dipole moment, and that could be harnessed for dipole-dipole interaction. We're also interested in preparing the molecule in the emotional ground state, and this is because the dipole-dipole interaction depends sensitively on the distance of the molecules. And therefore, um, ultimately, when the molecules are in the emotional ground state and we can, can hold them uh, steadily, um, then this reduce um, errors coming from the jittering of the wave function, basically, in mixed states. OK, so. Um, let me just put all the different systems uh, people worked on. Uh, 
um, including assembling the molecules from atoms or directly optically uh, again or tweeze out single molecules uh, from an ensemble of laser cool molecules, as well as uh, molecular ions, uh, which are uh, have been sort of um, uh, ion system have always been the forerunners of uh, gaining single particle control right from uh, the start. Uh, for this talk, uh, I will focus on our approach uh, to assemble molecules from, uh, from atoms. Now to make molecules from atoms, it's really like uh, a, a chemical reactions. And typically for chemical reactions, we start with an ensemble of uh, A and B, uh, ensemble of A and an ensemble of B, uh, and reaction proceeds through uh, stochastic encounters between reactants. What we found 10 years ago when we started with a bulk gas of you know, A and B, and in, the, in that particular case, case that I worked on was potassium and rubidium, we made ultra cold molecule this way, and the molecule can collide and become lost um, immediately after, um, after they were made. Um, so, um, so instead of kind of, um, Instead of you know, uh, kind of um, wor working with the bulk gas, uh, we want to gain these single particle control, uh, isolate them individually right from the star. So we want to start with two atoms and um, and isolate them and and induce the single reactions uh, with the with the resulting molecule trap and isolate it from it and from everything else. The physical system that we work with is sodium, uh, is a sodium cesium molecule made from uh, sodium cesium um, atoms. We made a proof of principle uh, demonstration uh, a number of years ago um, where uh, we basically followed this this general idea of kind of shown pictorially uh, using optical tweezer to grab single atoms and then steer the optical tweezer so that we can um, uh, merge the tweezer and the atoms inside them to be in the single well and then use a photon to bind them together, a photo association process to make the molecule. But these molecule that we made at the time uh, quickly decay into a variety of, of, uh, of different uh, states. The, these molecules we made were excited state, uh, electronic excited state molecule. So then um, um, the, the, these molecule um, are, were lost and, and they couldn't be used for anything uh, very useful. So since that demonstration, we have made uh, several uh, um, step to control the quantum state of the atoms. Um, and, um, and so control the quantum state of the atoms and, and subsequently mapping those uh, quantum state uh, onto the molecules. So we cool the atoms into their um, ground state of the, the tweezer confining potential put them together and associate them. And that's, um, that's something that I'll uh, discuss in a bit more detail. Um, uh, and more recently, and then also show you the data that we can do the sort of the last step where we can transfer these molecule in a particular vibrational, you know, quite highly excited vibrational state down to uh, a tightly bound uh, vibrational ground state where we, you know, have these internal state transfer to make a uh, row vibronic ground state molecule. Okay, so let me uh, tell you uh, the more detail about our experiment. So to make a molecule, we need to work with at least two different, uh, in our case, two, two different atoms, but in our case, two different species. We want the molecule to ultimately end up with a large dipole moment. So we want to work with two different species. We follow the pioneering work uh, of this in this field where uh, um, people have been able to demonstrate grabbing single atoms from an ensemble of uh, laser cool uh, atoms. Uh, in our case, we use two different colors uh, to be able to talk to, uh, to be able to sort of manipulate two different uh, atomic species. So we focus uh, different color laser beams through a microscope object uh, down um, uh, into our chamber to sort of sub micron uh, size uh, and overlap it with a laser cool ensemble. And with that, we're able to uh, grab 
um, you know, single atoms stochastically, and and in uh, and we can repeat these experiments to have histogram like this, where we see uh, some of the time, actually majority of the time, we're able to grab a single cesium and a single sodium atom side by side. These uh, images are the same field of view, just taken sequentially for better uh, signal to noise. And some of the time, we only grab one species, and some of the time, we uh, we got non uh, no atoms. Okay, so now these two atoms, you know, we that we 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 grab, uh, we can then uh, steer them into the same confining potential, and we are ready to make a molecule. Um, let me tell you the challenge of doing that and in the solution. So the challenge of uh, making molecules from from atom is uh, sort of twofold. One is that in um, in sort of this this case um, where we grab a single atom using uh, optical tweezer on the size of micron, the best that we can do to pinpoint the location, the wave function spread of this single particle is a zero point wave function spread. And that um, in, you know, sort of one of the weakest confining direction is about 50 nanometer. Now, if we have two atoms in the tweezer, like the case in our, our experiment, each one could have these kind of uncertainty of well, wave function spread. But we want to make a molecule, and that means we need to find two atoms at a distance of 0.2 nanometer. So you can see that these wave function overlap is extremely poor. And in fact, we can quantify it uh, 10 to the minus 6%. Okay, and so that's uh, challenge number one. The second challenge is that we had to, um, for the molecules to be made, binding energy need to be released, and that's a lot of um, uh, amount, a large amount of energy how uh, that need to be dissipated. Uh, compared to usually, we start with uh, atoms on the order of uh, mi micro kelvin uh, if we put in temperature units. Now, uh, luckily, there is a solution uh, uh, already, um, the, despite the challenge. Uh, and it's a two-step process that was demonstrated for bulk gas um, in Innsbruck and in, in Gila um, 2008. Um, actually, so I also, I work on that uh, for my PhD thesis. Um, so um, this, um, this solution, um, you know, was general, even though it was demonstrated for bulk gas, and um, it can be applied to uh, the same strategy applied to uh, single molecules. So the, the solutions are the following. Um, first, we start with atoms that are not bind. Uh, we can bind them into a weakly bound uh, molecule through a funnel feshbach resonance um, by a magnetic field ramp. And this allows us to make a feshbach molecule and basically prepare the, uh, paired up the atoms so that they're in a single quantum state. Now, the second step uh, uh, following that, going down all the way to the row vibrational ground state is a two photon process where this two photon process coherently transfer uh, the molecule down to the row vibrational ground state where the stimulated photon take away the excess binding energy. And, and, and this is where uh, that the molecule can be made uh, with very high efficiency. And I guess that, let me just say that in the result that I will show you from exactly two atoms, we can make a molecule with about 30% efficiency. Um, and, 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 the, and the molecule that we end up with is as cold as the atom that we start out with. Okay, at this point, I can take a, a brief break to, uh, to, uh, to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, there, there's, there's three questions. So June Simon is asking, how would you compare molecules to Rydberg atoms for quantum information processing, both yeah. offer long range interactions? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I want to get a little bit more detail later, but, but let me just say that, of course, um, uh, the dipole-dipole interaction for ad, uh, for molecule compared to Rieber atom is 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 is, is abysmal. But um, so Rieber atoms uh, obviously have much larger dipole-dipole interaction. But in molecule, um, 
every states that we're dealing with are can be very long lived. You know, they can be second. A coherence time could be seconds or ten seconds or hundred seconds. So, so in that regard, I believe, and I can show you um, 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 in one slide that we were targeting very very high fidelity. You know, fidelity of entangling gates of ninety nine point nine nine percent, and we have kind of went through a lot of the. Um, so the experimental imperfection that we have to deal with, and we think we can do it, um, you know, and it, for for what we have considered because of the the coherence, uh, the co the coherent, the intrinsically coherent nature of of of. Um, of the molecular state and the fact that these dipole-dipole interactions are intrinsic interaction, um, as opposed to something that um, something that you have to dress uh, dress the molecule with. Okay, um, so I'm wondering what uh, advantages or new control possibilities uh, does uh, does bringing this atoms together in optical tweezers offer as opposed to just conventional control with S-wave, let's say, Feshbach resonances or S-wave collision single state? Um, I guess I, I'm not quite understanding your questions um, since you're the one who asked, so can you clarify? <laughs> yeah, I can definitely clarify <laughs> yeah. that. Well, I mean, you mean you you uh, you're, you're bringing them together in optical tweezer, and yes. then as opposed to just having in them in bulk see, colliding I with see. each other, what what are the new options? Yeah, yeah. So so it, it, that's a very actually very very interesting uh, questions, and uh, so as I show you that um, so optical tweezer has the advantage and also their disadvantage. Uh, the dis let me just tell you the disadvantage is that the intensity is super high, um, so scattering process is is uh, could be a problematic thing, but but on the flip side, that the advantage is that it gives uh, tight confinement. So even though here I show you these are free atoms, they're not actually freeing optical uh, tweezers. They're actually confined by the optical um, tweezer uh, and uh, sort of a quadratic confinement here. So in our experiment, we are indeed actually by preparing the atom in emotional ground state, we already prepared them in a single quantum state. Um, so okay. this so, yeah. is yeah, I see. So you're not colliding atoms, you're colliding atoms, traps, traps in of atoms, essentially. Right, so. right. Yeah. And Bill Phillips is asking, you mentioned that the problem of having the molecules in a mixed state of, of center of mass motion, but on uh, any given realization, can we not think of them being in a pure eigenstate yet to be determined of such motion, and then do post selection, and then do post selection to get the ground or other desired state? Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a very good question. So I, in fact, I have a slide on that. So maybe, maybe if it's okay, then I'll get to that after I uh, discuss the. Uh, okay. The the last question is by Dan Stamper Kern, who's asking what explains the limited efficiency of ground state molecule formation. Yes, so the, this 30%, yeah. So I will also explain that. So basically the short answer is that how well we can prepare them in a single quantum state to begin with. And that relies on very good uh, emotional ground state cooling of atoms and manipulate them, which is my next slide. Um, so, so, so maybe I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on these questions as, as I go along. Great. Okay, thank, thank you for all the questions. Um, so so I, I already explained the approach that we're going to take, and now I wanted to show you um, just, um, just, just the efforts that we had made uh, to be able to uh, uh, perform those steps. So after we uh, capture these single atoms in the trap, we first cool them down to the emotional ground state uh, to exactly prepare ultimately that these two atoms in a single quantum state. And, and this is a technique of Raman Saiban cooling, which is uh, widely used in the atomic physics community and, and actually beyond, uh, beyond the AMO physics. Um, now um, we we could do a pretty good job, um, and you know the, these are the good numbers when we first uh, work on them, and then and since then we're we're a little bit more relaxed of what we do. Uh, so we can you know do uh, really high uh, real, you know, high fidelity preparation of single cesium and single sodium in their three dimensional ground state. Now, once they're in a single uh, motion, in a single and the motion and the lowest motional ground state, uh, 
uh, sorry, in the, in the motional ground state, then we then had to put them together into the sand trap so that we can make a molecule out of them. So they start with several microns apart and then we move them on the order of a few milliseconds while keeping them uh, as much as possible in the motional ground state. So when they emerge, ultimately, uh, we want these atoms to be in the, in the, um, still in the motional ground state. Now, before I go into talking about uh, making molecules, let me just uh, 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 take a slide and talk about uh, how we uh, make our measurements. So starting with these kind of image, you know, we first take an image to see uh, once we load the atoms, we see what we have. And for the scenario where we load only a single atom, even though we won't be able to make molecule out of it, we are able to use these data for uh, to distinguish a process that that takes only one body. You know, for example, lifetime or things like that. You know, if, if we take an image like this after the experiment, we take another image to see if that uh, that that atom is still there or not. Now, the more interesting uh, uh, data will, of course, involving the two body in our case. So those are the ones that initially we load a two atoms, one of each species. And then at, at the end of the experiment, we will again take an image to see uh, whether you know, only one left or both of them left. And, and if they're both of, the, sorry, both, sorry, only one left or none of them are left or both of them are left. And those are the possible scenario. And we're interested in looking at things where both species are disappear um, um, and uh, or, or things that are related to things, uh, things that are related to the uh, process that involve uh, both species. Okay, so so this is what you'll see, you know, one body survival and two body, what we call it one body survival and two body survival. So now uh, with the atoms that we prepare, you know, we try to prepare as best as we can uh, to the emotional ground state. We can then uh, ramp the magnetic field, and this is the, our apparatus, um, glass cell with large, uh, our microscope objective um, coming on the side, and then you can see these um, uh, large coils that, that can go up to uh, a thousand gauss. Uh, we can ramp this magnetic field um, through the Feshbach resonance to make molecules. Um, when we first do the experiment, we didn't really know. I mean, we have a prediction where the Feshbach resonance is uh, for the case of sodium cesium, but it has not been seen. Uh, but but it was clear, you know, once we did the experiment, we had very good signal to noise to be able to uh, to to pinpoint the location of Feshbach resonance. So we started preparing then at high uh, magnetic field which are atoms. And then we ramp across the Feshbach resonance and we saw the disappearance of the atoms. Um, and that uh, is due to the uh, formation of the Feshbach molecules, uh, which are dark to our imaging step. Um, now, um, we can reverse the process while also changing uh, how fast we make this sweep. And you can see that in the two-way process of sweeping through the resonance and back, we're able to recover most of the, um, most of the uh, population that disappear. And, and that means that these, uh, this process is adiabatic uh, and we didn't lose these population, just go into a dark state, uh, the dark to our imaging sequence. So this was very encouraging and um, we can also hold for some time while they're uh, in the state of Feshbach molecule uh, and saw that um, a lifetime of uh, on the order of uh, uh, five millisecond. So this um, turns out to be quite surprising. Um, surprising because um, we were expecting, you know, photon scattering uh, to be, uh, to give us more like a hundred times a longer lifetime. Uh, we have determined in our experiment that this is still photon scattering. So it's scaled linearly, these one over the, the, the time scale, still scale linearly with the intensity. It's just a hundred times too fast. Uh, we still don't know the reason, but five milliseconds is sufficiently long for us to do the next step. So now I wanted to address uh, this uh, question about the, 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 the states of the, of the, the, the quantum state of the atoms and how that map onto uh, the molecule. And that um, I think also hopefully will also answer Bill's questions. So when we think about um, making molecules, um, 
you know, from two atoms, it's best to think about these atoms not as individual atoms, but think of them in center of mass motion and relative coordinates. And of course, um, we can make this um, sort of simplified picture, that's always true, but make this simplified picture where we treat each one as a harmonic oscillator when the two trap frequencies are the same. And in our case, they're only different by about 10%. So we made this uh, assumption. Uh, just, just for, um, just to, just for explanation. So um, the center of mass and the relative uh, uh, quantum states are both uh, harmonic oscillator uh, levels. Now, um, in the molecule, uh, we also have these degrees of freedom, and the center of mass again, you know, just the molecule moving. Uh, that's the center of mass, and the relative. Uh, uh, degrees of the freedom is the rotations and uh, and the vibration of the of, of the two atoms inside the molecules. So this magneto association process uh, map um, whatever the states is here onto another states in uh, front atom pair to molecule. So in the case of S wave uh, Feshbach resonance, um, we you know we would pay, prepare. Um, atoms in the emotional ground state, which would be emotional ground state of the rel uh, co relative coordinate as well as the center of mass. And then we will map onto a uh, molecule, which is again, uh, emotional ground state, uh, but this time rotation also in the ground state because of this S way, uh, because of the lowest um, angular momentum. While the vibration degrees of freedom is determined by the Feshbach resonance, so it's actually highly excited, but 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 it is a single uh, vibrational level. Okay, so um, so given that, um, I wanted to uh, to address the question. I think this addressed uh, Dan's question. Uh, what is limit the molecule conversion efficiency. And in our case, it's determined by the relative motional ground state population of the atom that we prepare. Um, and, and in our case, um, after um, cooling and merging and, 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 and you know, not doing as a, as, a, as, a, as a careful job as we, we when we started out, um, do, do, doing the cooling, uh, we in the end, we have still pretty good uh, number, but that's limited to now uh, about 50% uh, of the initial load of atoms. Um, and of course, this is not fundamentally limited because uh, it's not fundamentally limited because we know we can do better with, with cooling and, and merging. We just haven't uh, been uh, spending too much time on that. Now, um, so these, these molecules that we made are in a uh, internal state, uh, in a single internal state, because the vibration state is determined by the Feshbach resonance. The rotation is also due to the S-way uh, resonance that we, 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 um, uh, that, that we use to cross uh, the, res uh, the utilize. Um, the external state is determined uh, by, the, by the center of mass motional state population of the atom pair. And in our case, uh, as I'll show you a little bit of math, um, the, the idea here is that, um, um, and, and so I guess just to close that, that, that we determined to be 77%. Uh, 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 and the way we determine this is, is the following. Um, 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 my student, Jesse John, uh, have um, made this calculation where by characterizing uh, the motional state population of uh, sodium and cesium individually through Raman sideband thermometry, we're able to determine sort of the population in the motional ground state. Now, the relative coordinate is what matters in terms of making a molecule. So all the molecules that we may have to be in the relative coordinate ground state but they don't necessarily have to be exactly motional, uh, center of mass, uh, motional grounds, center of mass, uh, motional ground state. They can have some uh, excitations. So um, she made the calculation and, and that um, is determined to be 77%. Now I want to um, also point out a different experiment. This is a, a very nice data um, uh, published recently by uh, a group at the, the group at Wuhan, where they've been working on creating single molecule. Uh, these single molecules are made of uh, two isotopes of rubidium um, atoms. And in this case, they made a molecule uh, the, the binding energy is about a megahertz using some microwave transition. 
And, and they're able to show that they can drive these microwave transition to make molecule. They can also drive uh, molecular motional side bands. Um, and, 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 and it's shown over here where they're able to go into the molecular state, uh, which is symbolized by this um, blue dip, or a molecular state with a, with a one motional, um, I guess, one motional heating and one motional cooling, uh, which, which because the, the atoms had already prepared predominantly in the, uh, in the motional ground state that this side band is suppressed. So this basically shows that by preparing the atoms in the motional ground state, um, that mapped out ultimately to the molecule that is created. Okay, so um, I also wanted to, um, while we're introducing sort of different ways of making these weakly bound molecules, um, fresh blood molecule being one, and the microwave transfer uh, going to one megahertz from the Wuhan group being the second one. Um, now, um, another approach that we take in my lab, uh, where we now have also had some success, is to use an optical Raman transfer. And in this case, we don't use flash rod resonance. We're far away from you know, 800 gauss. We're in fact only um, about eight, eight gauss, so no flash rod resonance. We're able to drive a, uh, using a Raman transition to go down to, uh, to the weakly bound state. And this shows that um, we can and do a coherent Rabi oscillation for a binding energy of um, quite large, seven, uh, 700 megahertz. So this particular scheme takes advantage of detuning away from sort of the lossy uh, near excited atomic threshold in the continuum state, um, all the way down to the bottom of a particular potential. So we detune from there. It relies on a pretty good intensity stability of the two frequencies, which we actually use um, then to be the same as our optical tweezer beam, but just piping two different frequency to achieve uh, such a transfer. Okay, so um, so I want to take another break here before I uh, talk about the next step where we go transfer down to the raw vibrational ground state. Okay, uh, Bill Phillips is asking, a factor of 100 in the lifetime due to phonon, photon scattering is a lot. What are your guesses? Um, yeah, this is... <laughs> I, I think we only had really wild guess at this point because this this one slide that I'm showing you here, um, this is this optical transfer we have been uh, investigating for actually the last uh, couple of years and had not been successful until now and and only now and 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 still not full contrast as we would expect. Also, for the same reason, we have very uh, we have large amount of access optical scattering. Um, so it, it does seem to us that there are some states that um, that have some other dissociation pathway that are different from like the usual radiative uh, pathway that we know of. Um, and we have not been able to. Um, I talked to many theorists. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to name them, them all here, but it's, it, we haven't been able to figure out uh, what, what is the real reason of that excess scattering. So if anyone have any good idea, I'd be happy to, um, to hear that as well. All right, so another question on Feshbach molecules. Uh, John Simon is asking, could the Feshbach molecule lifetime be limited by intensity noise on the trap heating the molecules? Um, That's an interesting suggestion. I don't think I, I yeah, so we need to quantify that, but I um that's an interesting suggestion. But I um I guess that will also go linearly with intensity. Um is that right? Um yeah, so we need to quantify that, but my guess is um is is, is that's probably not the source because um, our other system, like the one that I show you here, that we don't use a fish rod resonance, we also have, uh, you know, a, a large amount of access um, and and active um, scattering. And in this case, we know for sure we do a very careful job of intensity stability uh, stabilization. Okay, uh, Adam Kaufman's question: Can the trap merging procedure 
where two traps are brought together and both atoms end up in the emotional ground state, be, could that trap merging procedure be done in the absence of interactions or does it rely on them? It is better in the absence of interaction. So we, we use a state where the interaction is very weak. So if we try to use the state where the interaction is very large, then it could actually go into some emotional excitation uh, due to gain emotional excitation. So it is better to be done in the low interact, like weak interacting state. What if there's no interaction at all, just zero interaction? Um, then, then I think, I think that would be fine. That would be perfectly fine. All right, so that's it for the question for the second break. Okay, great. So now going back to about the, talking about this Feshra molecule we made, um, the Feshra molecule is over here on this potential energy landscape, potential versus uh, the energy versus internuclear separation. And, and our goal is to bring them down to the raw vibrational ground state where they will, uh, these molecules will have a large dipole moment. So this means that we need to find an intermediate state. And this is this, this very similar story for all the bioalkali case that have been done, you know, um, KRB, sodium rubidium, sodium potassium, rubidium cesium, and um, sodium lithium, and so on and so forth. Um, but not, it has not been done for sodium and cesium. Um, so anyway, so in this case, we need to find an intermediate states where it has good wave function overlap between the initial state and the final state, and that it can uh, turn a predominantly triplet molecule into a singlet molecule. Okay, so uh, we chose this state because this particular excited state, uh, vibrational state, sort of lie, in bet lie very closely to uh, a triplet, it's, it's actually a triplet but on the triplet potential, but lie very close to a single potential. Um, um, right, and then and then for this setup, uh, we have the two lasers, ultimately the two laser, uh, we, we first looking for this, we only need one laser, but these two laser are arranged sort of co-propagating with the optical tweezer with a certain polarization. Um, we lock the two lasers to a high finesse cavity. Um, this is a sort of characterization from our 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 uh, our, our systems, and uh, um, and and just for one of the laser, you know, we, we shine first of the nine twenty two nanometer laser to look for um, to vo look for this particular state, uh, particular levels, and we found actually quite close to the prediction. Um, um, and in, 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 yeah, quite close to the prediction and, and, and we can even sort of resolve uh, their fine structure uh, of, of this particular line um, in the excited state. Um, we have made assignment, but I won't uh, go into any details just to say that we pick out this particular one uh, to uh, continue our subsequent uh, pursuit. Now, this is another place that that kind of echo this axis scattering. What we found was really surprising, first of all, that this excited state is not in this not we purpose, you know, we, we try to do a careful job to not power broaden. Um, the excited state it has extremely broad line width. And this um, in some sense is consistent with the sort of axis scattering that we've seen, but it's but it's still of unknown origin. <laughs> um, and, and this transition is strong uh, and that's predominant because the Feshwatt molecules are uh, closed channel dominant. So with one million watts of uh, laser power, we're able to get five megahertz Rabi rate. Okay, so um, now we found the excited state. We, we, uh, we, we know where it is. We are a little perplexed by this uh, broad line in the excited state and this is, um, could cause a, a major limitations, um, which I'll come back to. Um, now we're ready to go down uh, to to look for this 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 um, uh, row vibrational ground state and the theoretical uncertainty. So their potential that was uh, constructed by uh, Tiemann's group at Han Hanover uh, with a very you know small uncertainty actually uh, about three gigahertz. So we're able to um, you know 
basically lock up our laser and sort of the first shot once we get everything dialed in and correct, uh, now calculating things incorrectly, uh, we were able to find this, uh, this row vibrational ground state. And we can vary the intensity and you can see we use very, very little intensity uh, to, uh, to get a relatively broad, uh, um, uh, broad um, line width of these, these uh, suppression of the depletion due to outlaw towns or dark resonance. Okay, so um, now, um, now, now we're ready to do the transfer. We're confronted with uh, the challenge of, uh, mainly the challenge of this very large uh, uh, bra excited state uh, that we've seen. Uh, the advantage of an optical tweezer uh, system in our case is that we're able to focus down the, the these, these, um, these you know, pump and stro uh, uh, stoke beams to be quite high. I mean, we're, we're not going extreme, it's about 10 micron and be able to get very high and um, also be able to get very high Rabi rates. So instead of sort of the more traditional approach that all the other bioalkali systems do is to use a, a scheme called stimulated Raman, uh, is it, yeah, stimulated Raman and diabetic passage, so stir up, uh, we actually choose to go uh, to do a detune ROM on pi pulse. So we want to detune away from these lines that are really broad um, uh, and, 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 and potentially causing star shift as we um, ramp the intensity um, in, in the stir uh, process, uh, we, we decided to go for a detune ROM on uh, pi pulse. Okay, so, um, so when we do that uh, with those parameters, we're able to see a dip um, and the dip symbolize that we're able to go down and find the, uh, uh, the, the Raman resonance of these uh, pulsing on these two uh, lights simultaneously. Um, we can pulse on the, the, um, the beans for a various amount of time and we can see these nice Rabi oscillations. So initially we start with weakly bound fetch bound molecule and after uh, pi pulse, we go down to the row vibrational ground state and then we can go back and forth uh, with several um, Rabi oscillations. And just reading from the scale here from exactly two atoms, we make a uh, uh, 30%, uh, make a molecule with 30% efficiency. Now um, this, sort of successful of this step, demonstrate that now we're able to have one molecular qubit in, uh, is now fully controlled. And the next step for us is to um, scale up and entangle then to begin to unleash the power of molecular qubits. So I'd be happy to take another break here. Um, so we have two questions. Uh, Bill Phillips is asking concerning the factor of 100 mystery. Yes. 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 <laughs> is there any chance of some laser light at other than the mean oscillation frequency, some other small, probably longitudinal modes that could do something nasty? Yeah. Um... Yeah, that is a good question. So in the in the in the in one of the experiment. Um, the optical Raman transfer into the weakly bound state where we are plaque from the scattering problem for quite a bit. Um, we put in a, um, uh, we put in a, a, a filter to uh, a quite narrow, so the 50 to 100 gigahertz narrow uh, band fil ASE filter to suppress um, you know, unwanted frequencies, and we have found a factor two improvement. So it was indeed helping uh, that these, these, uh, I guess it's amplified stimulated emission, um, but we couldn't see more than that, I guess. So it was a factor two help, uh, helpful, but, but, but it didn't completely uh, kill this, uh, yeah, <laughs> scattering source. And okay. we also try to look for, you know, the scaling, whether it's a two photon process and, you know, so far we just haven't really been able to pinpoint anything. <laughs> right. Well, it seems that this 100 uh, factor mystery is attracting a lot of attention. But let yes. me move on to another to another question, yes. which is uh, Christian Panda is asking: One can also do a stir up sequence with large one photon detuning. What is the advantage of the detuned Raman pi pulse? Yeah. To that? 
Yeah, so uh, I think, I, yeah, so I, I think there are many different parameter regime that one can find using stirrup or Raman. What we found empirically that Raman was better. We did try, I mean, stirrup is kind of what, what we tried initially. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so I, I can I, I, I believe fundamental. It's hard to know. I guess I, I don't have a I don't have a firm answer. Uh, you've talked to different people. People had different preferences. Um, we um, we have also had some signal with the tomb stirrup, uh, but it was not very robust for us. Um, so we don't we haven't investigated deeply uh, to know the reason. But uh, the the yeah. So so that I guess that that is, that doesn't give you. Um, probably the answer you want, but um, we will, um, I think we, what we will do is to study more numerically about the different parameter regime to see um, whether we can reproduce um, the different scenario to see whether that maps onto our system. All right, so that uh, we're done with the questions with third Yeah, day. and I guess I, the other thing that I wanted to say is that because everyone did steer up before, you know, on resonant or detune, we thought it would be more fun to do something else. So, so it is, and we showed that Roman transfer also works. So another thing to consider, I guess, for anyone who is interested in this direction, like there's, you know, there's not just one way of doing this. Um, okay, so, um, what I don't have slides on, I forgot to put in <laughs> as I was preparing, is that we found that, the, I guess I'll just say that, uh, that these molecules um, that we made turns out in the row vibrational grounds that in the kind of intensity that we use, which is 80 kilowatts per centimeter square, so quite large. Luckily, it lived for a very long time. It does not have that scattering problem in the row vibrational grounds there. And I'm sorry, I forgot to put in that slide on. So we saw, about and you know on the order of us you know we 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 went for about a second and we did not see uh, a measurable loss so these row vibrational ground state molecule live in a very intense being uh, intense optical tweezer and they live for at least a second so that was that's the good news okay so um now now um i mentioned at the beginning i think this is sort of uh, hopefully getting uh, to uh, John Simon's question, um, is that, you know, we think molecule has the advantage of intrinsic, basically the intrinsic uh, coherence uh, and the states that we can use um, are all in principle um, intrins intrinsically uh, coherent. And, and that's something that is, is how, we was, how we see that the system could have, you know, a large advantage over other systems. Um, if we can use it properly. So specifically, um, the scheme that we're thinking about entangling then is the following where we want to use states and, and these states are easy to find where all the states involved are long lived and feel insensitive. And we want these dipole dipole inter interaction to occur at zero electric field. So you know, that, that's where we can control the electric field the best by having no electric field, basically. And the way we're thinking about doing that is, um, you know, these two states are nuclear spin states. Um, and that's just, for example, that we can say an excitation loop here. And in order for these two qubits to interact, we will promote, say, um, in, in um, you know, where, where uh, population is in the one, um, the one state to an excited state. And this excited state is a rotation excited state. Okay, and then once it's in this rotation excited state, these two levels, you know, go to these panels, that these two levels can interact because they're in opposite parity state. So there, one is an S state and the other one is a P state. So there's a transition dipole moment that uh, swap them. So by preparing them in the right quantum state, they can begin to swap and we, we just had to time it at the right uh, time to bring them back down to, uh, to, to the original basis of zero and one. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a general idea. And, uh, and, and again, because all the states are insensitive to fields, these occur at zero electric field and these dipole-dipole interactions is intrinsic. We think that, um, that, that these process can be made with very high fidelity. So of course the picture, uh, the realistic picture of sodium cesium is that we don't just have these three states, we actually have 
more like 100 states in the excited state and uh, 32 states in the uh, ground states. But we're able to you know, just find states uh, that fulfill the requirement we want. And in our analysis, if we allow them to be really close, um, sort of microns apart, then at, at a particular field at the time we weren't thinking about fetch bar, uh, necessary fetch bar field, uh, at a, you know, a particular field relatively low, uh, we're able to have you know, entanglement of pretty high fidelity and limited by exactly the fact that there's all these other stay nearby. Now, um, now, a remedy to that is to pull them apart and make this longer. Um, and, and we did a calculations uh, where we basically, you know, basically if we just go longer and longer, uh, make, make it slower, then it won't leak out to, to, to the wrong, uh, leak out to, to, to uh, it wouldn't leak to the wrong state, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and like I say, we have analyzing uh, experimental imperfections um, like, uh, you know, field, you know, magne magnetic field, um, electric field, uh, fluctuation, and you know, utilizing some magic polarization or optical tweezer traps um, to have um, to have um, to to get away with the AC star shift of the, the the rotation ground in the excited state and these kind of things and, and analyzing like uh, heating of the system. You know, what kind of emotionals. Uh, states that we can tolerate, and we believe we um, should be able to reach um, these kind of um, fidelity. Of course, we have to demonstrate it, but we believe um, that that is possible. Okay, so uh, to summarize, um, 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 I've, I've, you know, I show you um, the the quantum control technique that we develop, and then we think these quantum control of molecule, you know, quantum control as a you know, big, big turn um, is essential for quantum science with molecules. In particular, we built fully controlled individual molecular uh, qubits, um, and we will begin to harness these intrinsic property for quantum simulation and, and computation. What I didn't uh, tell you, and just to kind of quickly advertise a little bit uh, uh, here, is that these quantum control molecule being able to prepare molecule at this extremely cold temperature also opens up some new fundamental study for chemical reaction. And in our case, we're, we were, and this is in our, in our experiment is uh, we work with potassium rubidium uh, in the bulk gas, uh, similar to the original GLO experiment, um, where we're able to observe chemical reaction going from um, initially prepared the KRB molecule uh, going to reaction product K2 and RB2 through a very long-lived intermediate. And this was quite surprising because um, usually intermediate live for a very short time. That's transformation from one chemical react uh, species to another. Uh, but the fact that we can observe that uh, was, 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 you know, it, it was actually kind of a kind of, kind of a feature for ultra cold reaction because um, first there's a, a deep well and there's little exosomicity. And the fact that we prepare them in the very low you know, energy states essentially has make a bottleneck effect where these, uh, these population couldn't find its way out until you know, much, much later on. Um, so this, this intermediate lived for a very long time. And because it lived for a very long time, we can also steer it and like turn on the light to uh, put it somewhere else. And, um, and this is interesting because usually when in a chemical reaction, you control the reactant or you control the product, but you rarely get to access the, the middle. Okay, so, um, and despite the fact that there is such a long lived intermediate uh, state, we, we have shown that we can still control something about the outcome, the quantum state, in particular, the parity of the rotation state of the outcome, utilizing uh, nucleus spin degrees of freedom. Um, and more information can be found in, in this archive paper. And sort of more recently, we're able to uh, get sort of the full map of these chemical reactions or so this chemical reaction ultimately end up in potassium rubidium dimer. And each one has a quantum state that we can completely map out in a correlated fashion. And this really sort of uh, tests quantum chemistry uh, theory uh, to sort of unprecedented, perhaps unprecedented um, precision. 
Okay, with that, I wanted to close by um, thank you all the people who did the work that I showed uh, today, um, the building of single uh, molecules from, uh, from two atoms is uh, the work done by uh, the people on this top row, Will, Jesse, Itzel, Kenneth, and Luis. Um, and, 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 and yeah, so the molecule um, and with newcomers uh, over here and uh, the KRB uh, chemical reaction work was done by uh, these people and, and Yu Liu who just uh, recently graduated and moved on to uh, move on to postdoc um, and also um, um, these are uh, people uh, who have come to the lab. With that, um, I would like to also thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any more questions. Um, all right, well, thank you very much, uh, Ken Quinn, for the very interesting talk um, and uh, on, the, on the most polar molecule, perhaps, of all. Right, all right. <laughs> right, <laughs> so. Uh, by, yes. Yeah, huge dipole moment uh, on apple dimers. We have a few questions. Uh, Bill Phillips is asking, what causes the decay of the Rabi flopping between atoms and molecules? Yeah, uh, it's actually, those are both molecule, but it's just weakly bound molecule versus um, row vibrational uh, ground state. So yeah, so we're still investigating, but so uh, uh, this, I would say a disadvantage of the, Raman skin is that it's very sensitive to star shift. And in our case, in order to get you know fast Rabi oscillation, we try to put in as much power as we have. And in, in this case, actually, um, the power, uh, the Rabi rays were in balance. So um, our up is 50 megahertz, down is 300 megahertz. And in this case, uh, we're sensitive to um, uh, was sensitive to Stark shift. So, so I think uh, uh, one of the major sources is that these uh, Stark shift is causing uh, decoherence because this data actually take kind of overnight <laughs> uh, uh, with, 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 the, with the kind of statistics, uh, low statistics that we're getting. Um, okay, so next question by Monica. Uh, in the outlook on quantum gates, did yes. I understand correctly that the exchange time is 50 microseconds, but the gate time is 10 milliseconds? Um, yeah, so no, no so so that, those are two different scenarios. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't use the time. So the, so the, okay, so go back to here. So the total gate involve a pi pulse and exchange in a pi pulse. And, and uh, the exchange time, yeah, it's just 50 microsecond and the pi pulse is on the similar order. Uh, and, and in this scenario, um, we have limitation due to off resonant excitation. So when we have everything longer, that's say, you know, this is the exchange time. So exchange like three millisecond, pi, pi, pi and pi are both three milliseconds made up total of 10 milliseconds. Then we can have these very, you know, not limited by off resonant excitation. So, so yeah, so several milliseconds and, you know, 50 microsecond is the right thing to compare. Okay, and what limits the gate time and why is it so much slower? Yeah, so the, it's because we purposely make it slow so that it doesn't go to the wrong state. So that, that, is, um, that is the reason because these states are, especially at this, these very low magnetic field, they're very close, they're very close by. So um, they can exchange to the wrong state. So, so now, um, and, and, and that, that is the reason it has to be slow. Um, but now we ha we're working with actually much higher field than we had anticipated initially. Um, we're working at 800 Gauss. So those, those levels are gonna be more space and ultimately uh, we, we had to run the calculation to see whether we, um, you know, we, we, you know what, what that limitation will be. Say if we are able to go back down to this, this is limited by, uh, this is limited by kind of how close we can bring the molecule uh, sort of realistically. Uh, all right, and the last question is by David Weiss about rearrangement. You showed a picture that seemed to show molecule spa spatial rearrangement. 
how do you tell where the yeah. successful ground truth yeah. molecule no, are No, yeah, so that picture is a asking. rearrangement of atom. Yeah, this is a very good question. So that's a picture of rearrangement of atom. It's not a rearrangement of molecule. Um, in the case of um, uh, collaboration work in John Doyle's lab at calcium fluoride, we can uh, do the rearrangement on the molecule because those molecules are laser coolable. They have optical cycling transition. In the case that we work with here with atoms, uh, we are thinking about ways that we can um, get information about the molecule. And because these molecules are now like we determined to live for a very long time on the order of seconds, at least, uh, we believe we can look at um, we can look at the atoms to infer um, whether a molecule is made or not. So what I what I meant to say is that um, the, pre, the the dominant source of you know, not making a molecule is not, not, the dominant source is not lost, but rather there are still atoms, but in the wrong state. So if we, so we're thinking about ways where we should be able to make the molecule and then check if we have atoms left. And if we have atoms left, we know we didn't make the molecule. And then that's what, that sort of would be a way to allow us to rearrange uh, things um, based on the fact that we know which ones didn't make molecules. All right, um, so uh, that's it for the question. So let's thank Kang Kui once again. And if, if Kang Kui can unshare yes. your screen, please. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that there is a post-seminar discussion with a, a link that's going to be shared in the chat. And so uh, as for the upcoming talks, we're having two talks um, by Christiana Koch. Koch, that's for the European talk on quantum control and molecular physics. And, uh, as for Weimar's uh, seminar, we'll, we will have two um, postdocs next time. We'll talk about precision spectroscopy of meonium and molecular ion uh, control. So hope to see you here next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>